Good morning. What a blessed day to be together, wherever you are, at home, here. We know that the Lord is with us wherever we are. So let's just take a second, and I want to take a deep breath. Hold it for a couple. We just took the breath of the Lord to calm us, to focus us, and to bring us together. Uh, we have a couple of little announcements before we get started. Um, I haven't seen Kathy for a while. Uh, how's the hand doing? <laughs> and Dave, you and I were over at uh, Las Robles at the same time. Glad to see you here. On the altar, we have two roses. One is for a baby Christopher, and that's Barbara's, from Barbara's side of the family. That's Allie's baby. And the other is for Remy, who's comes to us through Rod's son Travis. So we are so blessed to have new life. It gives us joy. It gives us focus. But right now, let's worship. Would you stand and join me in the call to worship? Let us be transformers in a broken world. Rather than breakers of harm, we would be healers. Let us be transformers in a broken world. Rather than destroyers, we would be builders. Let us be transformers in a broken world. Rather than devising havoc, we would bring about wholeness. Please join me in the opening prayer. We gather, O oh God, as people who want to be stronger Christians. We want our lives to make a positive impact on the world around us. We want to be more loving. We want to be more like Jesus. Amen. And the opening hymn? All right, our opening hymn is Help Us Accept Each Other. And laughter's dead. 
Kevin to slow that down because it's kind of a funky little tune there, but man, that was slow. <laughs> Which means that everything from here on out in the service is going to pick up steam and it's going to be a wonderful day of celebration. I'm glad that you're here. We really only have about 30 seconds to say hi to each other, so go, 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 go. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. How are you? That was our full 30 seconds, so. I know. Friends, friends, we're going to go ahead and continue. Even those of you who are still standing in the middle aisle, so. Now, my wife, as a first grade teacher, would say, class, class, and you would say, yes, yes, right, okay. Anyway, we're going to be having a really important weekend coming up here in two weeks. And on Saturday, here at our church, we're going to be holding a panel uh, of, of people that are experts in the area of human trafficking. And this is a group of four or five organizations from all over the world, including uh, organizations that we support on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, AIM will be in the house with us as well. We are going to have uh, the director and assistant director of AIM to be with us, as, in addition to others that are in the Ventura County area. And the purpose of the panel is to raise awareness of what's happening in the world of human trafficking. And I, I, it's awful for me to say in the world of it, but this is a very highly organized, very well-funded, and very prolific um, growing industry in our country. We think it's going somewhere else, and we think it might have started somewhere else, but that's kind of naive of us. Even to think that somehow in Ventura County that we would be um, not involved with something like this unknowingly. But the truth is, we will find out more about what the truth is. Um, the panel will be a pretty honest and open discussion about this subject. And so you might want to think about that in terms of how young somebody would be if they were going to join us that night. And we'll be having that panel for about an hour. And then after that will be a fellowship time so you get to know more about the local agencies, places you can be involved, things that you can do that we can all do to make a difference. When I was in England, um, it did my heart good when I walked into a couple of businesses and into uh, the post office to find posters and phone numbers in England, as we did find in Germany and Austria and in the Czech Republic earlier this year. Uh, last year, two years ago now, I, I'm, my time's running together. And when we were in Greece and also in Turkey, we found posters that were talking about this issue. So the world is waking up to the fact that we all need to be a part of this. Now then on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock right here for worship, uh, our folks from AIM will also be here to share with us a little further the story and uh, some testimonies of people whose lives have changed. So. I want you to put this on your calendar to make time for this. Uh, this may not be something that we just want to put on as a, you know, a third or a fourth option, whatever we have going on that weekend. It's really an important way for us to host the community. Now, Pastor Stan would be telling you all this up here, but he's a little busy right now. Uh, Ellen has just finished uh, having surgery on her leg, her ankle. And she's home healing, and he's preaching at San Fernando First Church. Uh, no, no. Thousand Oaks United Methodist Church. Yeah, I got the wrong one. So he's over there today. Hey, Stan, and hey, folks at Thousand Oaks. I know some of you watch. Um, but uh, so he will be heading up to our panel and working with us that weekend. All right, one more thing to, to focus on here. We're starting a brand new class this week, and it will be on... Tuesday for the women, uh, you'll get that time, you know, at the end when uh, Julianne gives us the life of the church and the men that meet on Wednesday, we're using the same material. But this is a new class. It'll be a Zoom class and it'll be on Wednesday evenings from 5 to 6 p.m. And the only way to go to that class is on Zoom. So if you need help getting on Zoom or if you're not sure 
Uh, I, if you lived through COVID, you might have an idea of what Zoom is, but uh, this is a way for people to tune in. Uh, the material and the Zoom link are um, on the email that goes out to the whole church. Uh, it is also uh, the material you can find that on our website, but the Zoom link you'll find in the church email. So if you don't get that or you're not sure how to use that, it's pretty simple. The one button will get you the whole booklet, uh, our study guide for six weeks, and the other button will say Zoom, and you just click on that, and it'll take you right into the meeting. So you just need to have a device with a camera and a, and a microphone. Um, and if you can't do any of that or you're not comfortable doing any of that and you still want to join us, that includes those of you online, then you can always contact our office and we'll send you a personal invite to the, to the Zoom class. And also we have a few extra study books in the back you can pick up on your way out if, if you plan to attend. Please don't take material if you're not going to be able to come. Um, this, is, uh, this is like a graduate level course of Christian study, being open to grace. It seems kind of odd that we're talking about the unmerited love of God that's for everybody, but the studies, uh, it's multi-layered. And so uh, if you want a book, I'll give you the full book that we're using. I've got all 80 pages copied and I'll give them to you after class, uh, after, after, well, this class, after worship today. <laughs> But we do invite you to come, and we especially invite those you that aren't able to come physically to the church. We'd love to have you come and spend that hour with us every week for the next six weeks. All right, that's all of the yik-yak that I'm going to talk right now. But I would love to have children come and join me here. Do we have a few that would come? Oh, good. Would you give them a hand? Yeah. So, did you know that there are two different kinds of cake that are in the world? And apparently, according to uh, our scripture today, there are good cakes and there are bad cakes. There are good people, there are bad people. There are people that are evil and people that are good. At least that's the way that it gets simplified. The truth is, there is no such thing as a good or a bad person. There are people that make really bad choices. And there are people that grow up in really hard lives. And then there are people that make better choices, and there are people that are privileged, that don't have to work quite as hard at being good, because everybody around them is always reminding them what it is. Do you have parents that do that all the time? Yeah, okay, all right. Go parents, right? Okay. Um, you might even have grandparents that do the same thing, right? Okay, so you have, and you have a whole church family that looks after you, so you have no chance. So I just <laughs> want to point out that. But for some reason, when we make cakes, like this one's from Pillsbury and this one's from Betty Crocker, um, can you imagine that there would be a good cake and a bad cake? They're cake, I know. How can you go wrong with cake? All right, right? But let's take a look. What is that cake called? Angel, Angel food cake, there you go. That's pretty angelic, don't you think? And it's fluffy and it's white. And and if it had a harp and maybe a few strawberries, it would be like, okay, there's angel food cake. But did you also know there's something called devil's food? <laughs> I'm not making it up. There's angel food. There's devil's food. What's the difference? This one's... Yeah, how many of you would rather be a devil than an angel? <laughs> there you go. Half of our congregation would rather be evil and get chocolate, and the other would be angelic and get that white fluffy stuff. I'm, I, I might hang out in this camp. So it's so weird, these names, for this particular kind of food, right? And, and uh, I, I was going to do all that research, and actually I didn't have time to, so th I would love for you to do this for me. So when you get a chance, get on a, a parent-approved computer and find out what, what happened. When, when did somebody decide that chocolate was devil's food cake and when was angel, angel food cake? And you might even find some people here who are a little older and, and quite wise and they may, they may know the answer or they'll make up a good story for you anyway, right? Okay. So do you think that eating either one of these makes you a good or a bad person? 
Does this force you to make better choices or worse choices? Is it, in fact, is there anything in the world that we could consume, you know, we could eat or drink that's going to make us an evil person? Well, the Pharisees would not agree with you. The Pharisees were a group of religious people who came up with a bunch of rules. And they decided that if you followed these rules and ate these things and washed your hands a certain way and washed your meat a certain way and washed your vegetables a certain way, that you would be a better person. You would be more aligned with God if you did these things and you were less aligned with God if you did those things. They even accused Jesus of not being a good person because he let his disciples eat without washing their hands appropriately in a place where there was no fresh water around for them to wash their hands. And there was no hand sanitizer in these days. So they got right after him. And that's what you're going to be following up with in, uh, in Sunday school today. But I don't send you out to Sunday school empty handed. So we're going to pray. I'm going to send you with something to take with you. Is that good? All right. Dear God, we thank you that you do not look upon us by what we had for breakfast this morning. You, you're not judging us based on how we have eaten this past week or even some of the things we've done that might not have been very nice, Lord. You don't look down upon us with judgment. You certainly don't want us to sin against you or our neighbor or to defile ourselves, but as Jesus said, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. It's what comes out of your heart. It's what comes out of your attitude. So help us, Lord, to understand what it is that we can do to walk closer with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this is what you get to take. Three chocolate and three white. And you can go be whatever you want. <laughs> Anybody want to do some baking this afternoon? <laughs> They're right here in the pulpit. All right. The scripture today is from Mark 7, verses 1 to 8, and verses 14 to 15. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, and that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it, and there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to, to, to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by doing it can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, and our anthem today is uh, Heavenly Sunlight.
right, thank you, choir. Thank you. Is this on? Maybe? Is it on now? There we go. All right, good, good, good. Um, so here's the thing. I, I got an hour and a half to tell you something, and I only have 20 minutes to do it in. So I need you to stick with me if you can. All right. So if you want to take a nap, you got you got 11 o'clock, 11:30. You can start that process. But this is the important stuff because it leads us into a whole lot more that we want to do in the month of September. Um, you know, September is a time in which we get back to school, we sort of re-enter maybe more of a pattern, some of us travel a little less, but honestly, September for us this year is a, is a month that we have to reclaim who we are and the joy that we can have in our life, even in the most dire of circumstances. Um, and there are ways to do that. Uh, joining a class is hugely important. Coming to the women's retreat is hugely important. Isn't that in September also? What, what weekend would that happen to be there? We're going to uh, have a, get on a party. A party's on Friday night, right? And on the 21st, we have a preschool and church speaking. All right. Okay, so Linda is underwriting the retreat, apparently, and <laughs> no problem. And it's for women, and it's going to be here the 20th. Is, uh, there's an address uh, to see Linda about, all right? And she's got flyers, right? And then the 21st here at the church on Saturday. Yes. Right, right. So I'm, I get the privilege of the opening prayer that day. I know that others are going to be here. I know Pastor Stan might be a part of it, and or Ellen might make her way over. You don't know. Kate's probably going to do one of the one of the breakouts. Okay. And Lynn Hartley. And Lynn Hartley's going to be speaking, and yeah. and others that she's looking at right now. Okay, so the women's retreat. Other things that are happening in September is for us to kind of recover from some. Things that we didn't expect. You know, we're praying for Janice and the loss of her sister unexpectedly last weekend. We're praying for Robin, who's our new administrative assistant who lost her brother-in-law. Um, and we don't know exactly how that happened, but he died uh, yesterday. Um, we have people who have fallen and, and uh, not gotten up right away. We're so blessed to have Tina in the room with us today as well. So, yes. So we have a lot to grieve and we have a lot to celebrate. But this is the state of the way things were all through human history. And it certainly was what was going on in the life of Jesus and these disciples. See, there was a couple of groups that were operative of, of religious leadership in those days. They would be considered kind of the higher ranking Jewish um, leaders. And there were three different groups. Um, the most ones, the one we know about the most were the Pharisees. And uh, there is a really silly song I taught you three years ago about Pharisees. They're not fair, you see. That's why they're called Pharisees. The Sadducees, because they're really sad, you see. <laughs> And then there were the scribes or these other groups that were uh, out there. Herodians were some of the more confused religious leaders, but they were only leaders by virtue of the office of the King Herod. But this is all about the way people were trying to hold religion together. They wanted to make sure that, that religious practices were not lost. And it's not that these people were necessarily evil. They weren't eating devil's food cake every day, you know. They, they also weren't eating angel food cake every day, unless it was kosher. And kosher was important. Kosher practices were so important just for people to live healthy lives. And so it's not that the Pharisees are necessarily evil by their intent. They just forgot that God was about love. So, for instance, they took the Ten Commandments, and they managed to write 500 more commandments out of the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like the Caneo Valley. If you look at the law books from back in the 1800s, you know, the law book was just about 20 pages long for the city of Thousand Oaks. And, and it included not spitting on the sidewalk. Did you know that? So stop doing that, okay? 
that was actually a law in most cities. And in in when they were started building sidewalks and where there was paved streets instead of dirt paths, you know, this idea of keeping some of the section clean while animals traversed on the main parts of the road doing whatever animals do. So this was about keeping things clean and organized. But they were so interested in that. They were so pharisaical in a sense of trying to keep the law that they forgot that the law was intended to keep people healthy and whole so that they could worship God, this God who loved them. Jesus came with a whole nother message. And he said to his disciples, I'm sure many times, yes, I know we're not exactly washing like we should, but you're hungry. This is our chance to eat. And then we're going to move on and take the gospel to yet another village or another town. Now, I've given you words that you probably won't find in the Bible, but it's just the human condition of the way that people lived in these times. And the Pharisees could not get past that. In other words, the Pharisees became irrelevant to the current state of Judaism in Israel in the year 30 AD. They no longer had the same purpose that they had before. There's basically 400 years between the end of the last prophet who spoke and is recorded in the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus. 400 years. You realize that's longer than we've been a country. So there is this period of time called the intertestamental period, and it was basically kept alive. God's word was kept alive through what was called the rabbinic tradition, meaning that the rabbis told the stories. And they told the stories over and over and over again, as the Bible had not been canonized yet. We had scrolls, but the scrolls came from so long before that people most could not read. And so this whole idea of keeping the story alive was to keep the tradition alive. So before we take a, you know, a, a kind of a judgmental eye against the Pharisees, they thought they were doing their best to keep things rolling, but they were also doing their best to keep a job. Pharisees were highly paid. Sadducees were of the temple. Pharisees were of the people. So they were out in the synagogues, in the villages, in the towns throughout Jerusalem, uh, throughout Israel, throughout, in those days, what was divided between Judah and Israel, the two different nations. And they had already been under this exile that lasted for a good couple of hundred years where they were dragged off to what was it that day, you know, um, the people that came from Baghdad, um, who came from Babylonia, and they were trying to rebuild. So I'm just trying to give the Pharisees a little bit of a fair shake and a little better vision here. Jesus did not see them as individuals as evil, but he did see them as hypocrites. Every time they bring up a law, they weren't interested in the message that was happening or that Jesus was the son of God standing before them. They were more interested in keeping the order which kept them fed and kept them in power. Gosh, this sounds like something going on today. Let me think, oh, how does that work? Where religious institutions rile up and start to quote laws and things out of the book of discipline to keep everything the way that it's supposed to be. And they'll have churches just continue right on, maybe singing the same songs or having the same kind of worship, thinking that it applies today as it did in the 1920s or even the 1950s. And the question we have to ask as we sit in a room that is more than half empty, are we still relevant to the message of Jesus today? Are we still saying the things that God would want us to say and praying the prayers that God would honor? It's a tough question, people. I sat in a church of 2,000 chairs, and there were about 80 of us. And it was a grand cathedral built in the 1200s. And I could see on the face of the priest who was you know, preaching that Sunday, a little bit of dismay when he talked about all those people that we need to serve in the world because, and I love the way he said this, he said that I'm not concerned about us keeping everybody in this room, but I'm very concerned about having the ability of this room to keep the community we live in. The way I would put it is, it's not about seeding power, it's about sending power. 
It's not so important that we fill this place up every Sunday, but it is very important that we stay relevant with the community we live in. And so there's just some simple principles here that Jesus would want us to look at. First of all, let's not look at the outside of anybody and make a prejudgment. That's the way of the Pharisees. If you want to look outside of somebody and make judgment about who they are, I've completely lost the remote. Wait a minute. But I have no pocket. Let me see here. Let me see if I can get to it. Uh, yeah, there it is. Woo. Okay. This is about us. Oh, let's get past all that. This is about us looking at how we can move beyond the rules by which we do church. It's important to have some order, and it's certainly important to have an order of worship. That's why we have one every Sunday, because we don't want to forget anything in worship. We want to make sure we praise God, that we get a lesson, that we respond to that lesson, and that we're sent out with God's blessing into the world. Well, it's really about going from the 500 rules back to the 10 rules, which worked for the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus said, I come to fulfill those laws not obliterate them. He, he wasn't going to get rid of all these things that needed to happen in order for there to be order in the world. But he was saying what you eat and how you dress is not the measure of your godliness. We need to go back to the simple parts of the rule. Like, for instance, if you're keeping the Sabbath day holy, then it doesn't really matter what you wear to church. And that would just shock my, my, uh, my church lady, I called her, uh, when I was going to seminary. And I was serving a little church in North Georgia. She said, if a woman doesn't come to church with a dress on, then she shouldn't come into the sanctuary. Anybody wearing pants just wasn't welcome in that little country church. And then the operative word here was little. It was a little chapel that got littler and littler and littler. And finally, there were only about 12 people in the room. And that church lady was still in charge of the room. When I got to Imperial Beach, I was sent there to close that church. That was my first assignment as a pastor of the CalPAC United Methodist Church Conference, was to go to Imperial Beach and close the church. And we had more than 12. We had about 20. And the very first Sunday I was there, they had bills stacked up on the, on the, on the altar. The bills of the church, the electric bill, the gas bill, the water bill, the property taxes. And I said, wait a minute, somebody's misplaced these things. You know, these shouldn't be here. So I gathered them up off of the altar. It was communion Sunday, by the way. And I pulled them all off there and I walked them out and I said, what are we going to do with these? And this, this man stands up in the back of the room and he says, oh, pastor, this is bill collection Sunday, bill pay Sunday. And everybody clapped. And I thought, wow. <laughs> now he wasn't pharisaical. But he was the treasurer, and he wanted to get the bills paid. So the rule in that church was, the pastor holds up the electric bill and says, I hear God calling somebody to pay the electric bill. <laughs> and I, I gathered the bills up, and I walked it over to this man, the treasurer. I didn't know he was the treasurer. I was my first Sunday. And I handed him to him, and I said, I think we're going to find a different way for God to use us than to spend our time in worship paying the bills. I don't know, Jeff, do we need to? No, we don't need to hold them up. Oh, praise be to God, we don't have to do that. All right, so the second Sunday, I fired the lay leader because she was that church lady who had kept the church getting smaller. She actually stood in the back, and every time a visitor walked through the door, bless her heart, she'd say, how long do you plan to stay? That was her opening line as the greeter slash usher of the church. As the lay leader, every Sunday, how long do you think you might want to be here? And she sat people accordingly. She would put the people that she didn't like in the very front row to embarrass them because it was the only row open in that little chapel. But anyway, whatever, whatever, whatever. I will never forget when this young woman came with her baby and uh, we had a child care room. We didn't have child care workers because it was, <laughs> this church was already thinking in terms of how are we going to die. In fact, my first sermon in that church on that very Sunday that was Bill Pay Sunday was, what do you want on your tombstone? <laughs> you remember there was a pizza company yeah. that just launched an ad campaign? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, 
I, I said at the beginning of the sermon, now I'm talking about pizza, of course. What do you want on your tombstone? You want pepperoni? You want cheese? And they're all nodding their head like, there's something really wrong right now. <laughs> I was 26 years old. I didn't know any better. So I said, here's the deal, folks. In the closing of the worship on that first Sunday, I said, I've been sent here to close you. I have one year to close this church. Anybody that's not happy with that or thinks we could do something different, why don't you meet at the parsonage this afternoon? Stephanie and I will have some cookies and angel food cake. I don't know what we had, but we had something and coffee. And sure enough, I had like 10 people show up to that, that little meeting that day because I wasn't interested in following the rules, not even of my district superintendent who told me what to do to close that church. I was a rule breaker. And I, was, I, w I could have hung myself just as easily as I could have made a difference in that church. But I got to tell you, those 10 people, which, by the way, were not the chair of the council, nor the treasurer, nor the chair of finance, nor the chair of trustees, nor the lay leader. They never showed up to one of those meetings. I had the 10 people who wanted the church to live. The others were just happy holding to the rules, and becoming irrelevant. Look, I'm not bringing up something that you haven't heard before or haven't thought of before, because all of us know that the church in the United States today, the Christian church, is in decline. We're, we're having fewer and fewer people participate in it. And I think our biggest question before us is, how can we be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ today and does that mean we have to eat once in a while without washing our hands properly? Probably so. Does it mean we need to invite people into the church that are wearing pants or shorts or not having more than one set of clothes to their name? Maybe we have to think about how we present ourselves to others and, and can we be a church that's truly hospitable and open to others? We had a young couple here last week with their son and they stayed for an hour after church because of your hospitality, because people took an interest in them, because people didn't listen to their accent and get a little weird about the fact that they were born and raised in Germany. There was a day in the Methodist church after World War II where Germans were not welcome in the church. The white, blue haired, blonde haired, doesn't matter who those persons were, or where they came from, you know, it was the fact that they had an alignment or an allegiance, or at one time their family lived in a country that we happened to be at war with. If we started selecting each other in our community based on where we've come from, then half of us in this room wouldn't be welcome here. Because we all come from somewhere. And we all have kids who married somebody who came from somewhere. And now we have grandchildren who are being born into this world. And you know what? The generation that's coming up and the two generations before that, they don't really care where you come from. They just care about what you present, how you love, and who you are. By the way, these are not in my notes. None of what I've said to you is actually over here of what I wrote. But I figured this 20 minutes should count for something. So I'm here to say to you today, John Wesley was one of those persons who stepped out in faith to say, we have to know what's better. We have to know what's of God. And we have to know what's not important anymore. This is the new room. It's a place that was built in Bristol, England. It was a room that was constructed within months because John Wesley showed up and he had so many lay preachers that wanted to serve with him that they all came to gather, but they had no place to gather that was safe because the Anglican church didn't want this group to gather, nor did the Church of England, nor did the, um, the people that were, um, I can't remember the name of those folks, but they lived in Bristol and they had their very well organized religion going on and they had everything set the way they wanted it to in this, in this harbor town. And, uh, you know, from the docks and the sailors all the way up to the people that lived on the top of the hill with the widow's walks on their houses. This was a very organized community. And these lay preachers showed up talking about this radical love of God where we accept everybody and everybody's welcome, except the lay preachers who were always in danger of where they were 
because they were not of the same kind of aristocracies of religion. They, they weren't ordained pastors. They weren't trained pastors. They weren't legally ordained in the church. So they, they weren't even allowed a pulpit. Well, John Wesley thought, we need a room where we can gather and talk about God's love and how we're going to be the church into the future. So he built a church with two pulpits. Uh, it's a little hard to see here. I'm sure Jeff will put this full screen for our folks at home. But the lower pulpit basically has a pulpit there. It's at the bottom of that particular staircase. But if you look on the top, there's a second pulpit. And that's where John preached from. And the reason that the only way you can get to the top pulpit is by going outside and up a set of stairs on the outside of the room and coming in from that way is so that people couldn't rush him in the middle of his sermons. One Sunday that uh, there, a riot broke out in this room was when John stood up and started preaching. That's me standing up there right now pretending to be John for a minute. But uh, it, he preached on slavery. He had 500 sermons focused on this, but this particular group of 500 words he used about how we need to eradicate slavery worldwide, well, some of these lay preachers had slaves working in their homes and in their fields and in their factories. Not employees, just people that they had purchased to serve them well. And this was to protect the preacher and then the person down front was the liturgist so Jack would be like you're here and people could get to you but I'm going to stand up there where I preside over the table and good luck man I, I, I pray for it <laughs> this is how the new room was set up and the new room was set up this way also because of, and I don't know if I have a picture. Yes, I do. So up there, you see the window that's in the far left corner, upper corner of this. There were windows in the room, but they were 20 feet off the ground. So nobody could look in and see who was in the new room. There's one more thing about the new room is it didn't have pews. Those were added in the last 50 years because people thought they could take old pews out of other churches that existed at the time. But the new room was not a church. It was a training ground. It was a place to prepare people to go out and encounter the world and to take the word and the love of Jesus Christ into the world so that they would be relevant to the world and its needs. And these lay preachers, by the way, that's our tour group there. And this is the a director of the new room who's restored this old building and, and basically brought it back to what it should be and fought against getting the pews back in there because they never were in that room. They were always chairs that were set up so people could sit in a circle configuration and support each other. And then during worship, they would make them semicircles in order to face the pulpit that's off to the left. I show you the new room because this was the attempt for the Wesley movement to be radically relevant to the times. See, these were the group of preachers that would go out to the coal mines where religious people never went. These are the ones that went onto the streets of Bristol and London, of Bath and other sailor towns where people needed to know the love of God. Well, this is what the new room did. This is the old of the new room. This is what the historic building looked like. It, by the way, it fell down a year after John built it because they didn't have enough construction know-how, mm -hmm. but it was rebuilt a few years later and served for hundreds of years as a place of setting people forth with ministry. So the director said, this is a great old room and some people are going to walk through here and really appreciate it, but we need some reason for people to gather people like who live today and are not in their 80s or 90s. So he went this way. He built a coffee shop and an atrium. And there's a sign out. And this, this by the way, this, this whole, uh, the new room and the atrium and the coffee shop, it exists between one of the biggest malls in the eastern coast or western coast of England and a, a main street where all these businesses were. And they made a place for people to come in. And they got great big signs out front that says the new room. So people are walking in there. That day, we probably saw 100, 150 young adults walk into that coffee shop and look around because they thought they were in the new room. 
By the time they made it to the new room, which is actually 300 years old, they realized that they were part of something special, something better, something more intriguing. This is the way John and Charles Wesley intended this. Now upstairs from the new room were housing uh, for the lay pastors. Uh, There was a place they could sleep and get a meal. And their housekeeper was Sarah. This is an actual sculpture of Sarah. And Sarah was a unique person. She had been married three times. In fact, she was on her fourth marriage when that person also left her. John Wesley's wife wasn't happy that Sarah was the housekeeper. In fact, this was during the four years that John and and, uh, Molly were actually together. Uh, Molly had an opinion about Sarah and called her a whore. And she warned all of the lay pastors that were there, that were mostly men. There were women who were lay preachers at the time. She said, stay away from Sarah. She's, she's damaged goods. She's evil. If you get to know her, you'll be evil too, like eating that devil's food cake. John saw in her potential. And a humble person with a broken heart. Truth is, she didn't have four husbands. The first husband cheated on her, and she left him. The second husband died on her, and the third husband died on her, and the fourth husband cheated on her and died anyway. And here's Sarah trying to rebuild her life. And John said, here, you take care of all these lay preachers. Everybody deserves a second chance. In my way of thinking... And obviously in others, Sarah is an example of being relevant to the community we live in, to see people as potentially servants of God, but everybody a child of God. I'm going to quit here. we got more to talk about. But in the meantime, we would love to come celebrate the fact that we can be relevant as the children of God when we are not so pharisaical about everything else we do in our life. For who are we to judge somebody from the outside appearance or from what we think about them? Maybe we should leave judgment to God and maybe we should be the body of Christ engaging all people with love and compassion. Let us come to the communion table with this thought that we're not deserving of this meal. It is an open table for every person, whether you're a member of the church or not. And it is a place that we will have the co-celebrants join me in a moment after we go through the great Thanksgiving. And uh, we will have time afterwards to fellowship as we receive the body of Christ today. The great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your peop- all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and heaven earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, 
and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your choice, to your church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. God, we give you thanks today for these gifts. And as the co-celebrants come and stand with me, we continue our prayer, Lord, to give thanks to you, just as Jesus did on that night when he was with his disciples. For on that night, he asked for those who were amongst him at the table to recognize the importance of the meal, but he did nothing of the Seder meal they expected. Jesus was being relevant. He was trying to express to them the importance of the covenant that is about to be made between him and you, O Lord, and between him and the people at the table and the servants beyond the table. So therefore, he lifted the bread during the meal. He gave you thanks, O Lord. And then he said to the people at the table, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took that cup of the covenant and he gave thanks to you, O God. And then he said, this is the new covenant. I am the new covenant. And it is for the forgiveness of sins. Take this in remembrance of me. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on these, the gifts of bread and wine that they be for us, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, as we become the body and blood of Jesus Christ to you and to the world. Lord God, let us remember our place, that we don't deserve to be at the table, yet you invite us through your grace. We don't really qualify to be your body in the world, but through your grace, we can be your love to others and a guide to God himself. Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful for this opportunity. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray for blessings, we pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need. Yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, 
your voice to hear. And we cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain remind this hard. This is not, this is not our It's not our home. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes? to know you're near what if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is a revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy and what if trials of this life the rain the storms the hardest nights all your mercies in disguise. Let's go to God in prayer. Loving Lord of all, we give you high praise and thanksgiving for this time together to sing, to be motivated by inspired message, to be brought closer to you by heavenly music, and to be blessed to take Holy Communion. We come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts that you sent your son Jesus to guide our lives so that we can find your path to salvation. We know that you are with each of us, all those who are worshiping and lifting their hearts up to you, and we recognize Tahunga United Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church of Inyo Kern. Thank you, Lord, for baby Chris being out of the hospital and home with his family, making progress. And we give you thanks for baby Remy for his entry into this world, and we pray for his thriving. Be with their parents as they care for them, 
that they may have strength and faith. Prayers of thanksgiving for Ellen with her successful surgery and strength for Stan as he cares for her. We ask for her speedy recovery. We celebrate that Tina is here with us today and we ask you to continue her healing. Prayers for recovery for Taylor and strength for her future treatments. We ask a blessing on the family, including grandparents Kathy and Bob, for their support. We continue to pray for Randy for improved oxygen levels and a successful hip replacement. Be with Chad and all those seeking sobriety that they can find your path. We're thankful for Chuck as he continues to heal, along with Dave, who's able to be here today after his heart surgery. And we give thanks that Roger's son is recovering from his heart surgery as well. Many thanks for those who are now cancer-free. And we pray for those to continue and the remission and restoration of health will come to all that are fight, fighting that disease. We pray for those in hospice care. Be with Michael and with Jennifer's mom. May they be at peace without pain and faith for their journey. We mourn with Janice and Tim at the passing of Janice's sister. Be with Robin and her family in their grief with the loss of a dear brother-in-law. We have received so much, and there's, but yet there's so much to do. Sometimes we become overwhelmed with the challenges of life. At those times, help us to rely on you, Lord. Help us to remember the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we pray it together now, led by Lark. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Help us to re reflect now on all that we have received. Open our hearts and help us see the unfinished business of the church, in the community, in the nation, and around the world. And remember that in your sight, all of us are relevant.
Eternal and loving God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that we have received. Most importantly, we give you thanks for the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that made our lives relevant. Please, accept these our gifts and tithes, that they might be used to further your kingdom here on the earth. Anyway, um, we're going to actually have our closing hymn. This is a Charles Wesley hymn. We're not going to sing it. We're going to go to the first verse. It's two slides, maybe. Is it one slide or two? Just one slide. This is our, this is our benediction. Because this speaks to how God's love is unfathomable. Grace is unfathomable. We can't define it, but we try our best to understand how it makes us relevant to God and therefore us relevant as we are God's presence in the world. So let's read this old English together. Oh, the depth of love divine, the unfathomable grace, who shall say how bread and wine God into us conveys, how the bread of his flesh imparts, how the wine transmits his blood, fills us faithful people's hearts with all the life of God. We pray this, O oh God, knowing that you call us to go forward. Let us do so knowing that we truly are still relevant in this world. In fact, the world has never needed your love and grace more than it needs today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. Thank you. And thank you uh, for playing, and thank you for singing. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, choir. You're back. We're so happy that you're back. Yes. Do you want to say something about our study? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I would love that. Great. This is the same study for all the groups. So, yes, the Zoom study is added, and I hope that those of you that work and can't be coming to a study on 10 or 11 o'clock on a weekday, you know, will be able to join us to jump in. One question that's come up is, can I come to lesson three if I don't come to one, two, five, six, seven, whatever? There's only six. But uh, the answer is yes, you can jump in. Um, but I would love for you to be able to read uh, the material that we've got for you. It just it's, it's online. Everything was sent out on Friday, and it will come out every week. Um, we're not uh, putting the Zoom link on our website because, for obvious reasons, we don't necessarily want somebody that doesn't want to be there to show up for some other reason. So, but everybody who wants to be a part of the class will get a link to you so you can be a part of it. Yeah, that's fabulous. So it's an all-church study. Got that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, okay, so what else do we have going on? Save the day. Oh, crap. So many talents in our church, right? What do they say? Prayers, presents, gifts. That's the gifts. Right? And announcements. We're in. That's all the same. And script. So who likes to go to Chili's? Who likes to go to Islands? Oh, yes. Yes. Who likes to go to Applebee's? We have script for all of that. So go see Stephanie at the end of church. She's all set up. They have script for you. And like I said, just download the app. And then every week you just give to the church at any time. Any store you go in, you just look and see if it's there. I've got Target, PetSmart, uh, Home Depot. And Albertson's right in my wallet all the time. And it just keeps giving to the church, giving to the church. It's amazing. I love it. Uh, we have birthdays. Altar flowers. Thank you to the McEachrins. I cannot believe Sadie Grace is 10 years old. That is crazy. I remember when she was born. And thank you, Judy Corey, for uh, breakfast. And welcome our new additions, Christopher. Oh, he's so cute. And Remy, oh, she's cute too. Wow, so many blessings in that family, right? Yeah, Rod and Barbara have a lot of blessings. And happy birthday to Gary, my Gary Gawain, Carol Sylvester, 
That's Carolyn Sylvester, I believe. Yes, Beth Ellerson. Jeff Young is here. Happy birthday, Jeff. And Aaliyah Ellerson. Can we all sing? Matthew's church family, welcome home. 